The Roadcaster Duo is a small device that packs a pretty big punch with all of the capabilities of a full-size Roadcaster Pro 2 built right inside this tiny little guy right here. But the Mackie DLZ Creator XS is also an extra small device that still has all the capabilities of the DLZ Creator, its larger counterpart, which is so big it also takes up a larger part of your counter. So let's see how these two audio mixer, interface, recorders compare, and hopefully this can help you Mackie the best decision. So a few disclosures to get out of the way first. Mackie did send me the XS for free, but I'm under no obligation, no excessive obligation to say anything about it or even make a video about it. They actually didn't even give me a heads up that it was on the way. It just kind of showed up in the mail about a month ago, which was a really nice surprise. And I was actually really excited about it because I do think that the first DLZ creator, the full size one, was really the first true competitor to the Rodecaster. But as great as it is, this is just too big for me personally to incorporate into my setup in a practical way. So the XS solves that problem because it does exactly what the Rodecaster Duo does, which is take all of the capabilities and performance of its larger counterpart and just put them into a smaller form factor. And as you can see between the two here, I really do love this unique form factor that the XS has because it doesn't just look like a clone caster of the Duo. So before diving into all the finer points between these two mixers, let's just jump straight to the conclusion and then we can fill in the details after that. So the spoiler is that both mixers are awesome. They have the same $499 MSRP and I don't think you can go wrong with either one. Right now you're listening to me through the Mackie DLZ Creator XS with no effects and no processing. This is the Rode NT1 Signature Series. And just for comparison, this is me on the Rodecaster Duo with no effects and no processing on the Rode NT1 fifth generation. So these are basically the exact same microphone. The only difference is this has USB-C, which I'm not using. In terms of XLR capabilities and sound, they are the exact same microphone. So you should get a pretty good idea in terms of just a dry signal and an unprocessed signal. This is the Rodecaster Duo. And in terms of a dry, unprocessed signal, this is the DLZ Creator XS. So as I was saying, I don't think you can go wrong with either one of these mixers. They both do a lot of the same things, but they just kind of approach them in slightly different ways. The XS is very comparable to the Duo. You Duo have two XLR quarter inch combo jacks, two headphone outputs, monitor outputs, quarter inch inputs, Bluetooth, and built-in effects and processing. So that means it really just comes down to personal preference. If you like one mixer's interface, design, or overall approach, you might find that one of these just kind of clicks with how your brain works more than the other. And then that is the one to get. If you're stuck between them and you don't know and they're the exact same price, it kind of does become a coin toss. I think as much as I love the Rodecaster Duo and as much as it does have some strengths over the XS, I think if you told me right now I had to pick one and that's the only one that I could use, I think I would actually lean towards the DLZ. Because even though they are both excellent and both similar in a lot of ways, and the Rodecaster does have some nice usability and user interface things that I think do outperform the XS, Overall, I have found that it's easier to get higher quality audio overall from the XS than the Rodecaster Pro. I'm very much splitting hairs, but if you told me I had to choose one of these and I had to pick one, I would lean towards the XS. Covering one of these is like covering something like Adobe Photoshop. There are so many features that it's hard to go into every single one in depth, and so I just kind of can't, but I wanna give you an overview as to how these two compare to each other and you know which one might fit better for you. But my biggest caveat in this comparison has less to do with the mixers themselves and more to do with the relationship between Mackie and Rode, which I will dive into in more detail at the end of this video, but it's definitely something that kind of makes me nervous and gives me a little bit of concern. So overall, I would say that the Rodecaster Duo is a bit more user-friendly, especially when it comes to simple things like listening to playback of recordings, routing, or configuring the smart pads to do different things or have different sound effects or different functions. Playback is kind of a good example because if I want to play back a file I recorded on the Rodecaster, I just select my recording and press play, and then it comes through my headphones and I can adjust my headphone volume and that's it. With the DLZ, both the full size one and the XS, you have to go into the settings and assign playback to one of the faders, which at least for me, ended up being trickier than expected. It's not really a big deal, but it's something where I spent a few minutes being confused, where on the Rodecaster, there is zero confusion. And if you're used to something like a Rodecaster, or you're a complete beginner who's never used a mixer like these before, there are a, quite a few things like that in the DLZ that might cause a little confusion or even lead to making some mistakes because when it comes to the full-size DLZ creator, I'll hold it up again because I'm a visual person, Mackie's goal with this was that they wanted to create something that was, they said, a little more premium and a little more professional than a Rodecaster. So 
even though it does have things to make it more approachable and accessible to beginners, it really is designed to be appreciated the most by somebody who does have some kind of audio engineering, audio processing experience. And for people who felt like maybe the roadcaster has limited them in some way, the DLZ creator was a good thing to sort of, you know, take away some of those restraints and make them feel more like they were using a full-on professional device. So even though the XS is much smaller and seems like a much more user-friendly device overall, it still kind of has that DNA within it where it is geared towards a more traditional audio professional workflow than something like the Rodecaster Pro is. But that does mean then on the flip side, the DLZ Creator XS is much more fun for diving into the nitty gritty of EQ and processing. This giant display, which is actually smaller than the original, significantly bigger than the Rodecaster Duo or the Rodecaster Pro, this giant display is really a joy to work with and the overall form factor I really like. And even though there are those areas of confusion, like I mentioned, trying to assign playback or whatever it might be, Mackie's user guides, I really have to give them credit here. Mackie's user guides and documentation are literally the best I've seen for any product ever. There is a quick start guide that is incredibly helpful and gives you everything you need to know about every part of the Creator XS. And then of course the online digital documentation is incredibly well written and helpful and constantly updated. And all the documentation covers everything you need and is written in plain and simple language that's super easy to understand even when covering advanced features. And Rhodes documentation is really great too. And the fact that it, most of it's online and digital means it's constantly up to date. So now that we've covered the spoilers and the conclusion of this comparison, let's dive into some of the specifics. The biggest difference you'll probably notice right away is that the Mackie does not have channel faders. They have faded out the faders and dialed up the dials. I thought this was gonna be a problem at first. I was very nervous and I almost immediately was like, oh, this is not gonna be a thing for me. But it turns out they work great and the dials still do have a Unity mark so you can still bring them up to Unity level even though it's not a traditional fader. Even the brightness of the LED below the dial changes in intensity depending on how high you have it turned up. And it does correspond perfectly with everything that's on the display, which is a more traditional sort of interface. So if you want to nail that Unity mark right there, you can do that pretty easily. If you want to turn things down, you can do that pretty easily. And you still do have your mute and solo buttons above them, just like you do on the creator, the big DLZ creator, and just like the roadcasters have as well. And this display is why there are no faders, because if you had the display and then faders, it would end up being a full size mixer device like a roadcaster Pro 2 or something along those lines. Whereas now it's very similar in size, just slightly different shape to the Rodecaster Duo. But otherwise, these two mixers are gonna look pretty simple overall, and I can go in, like I said, I've been recording without any effects or processing, but if I go into my channel and I turn on my processing and my EQ, now I've got my Rode NT1 Signature Series, I've got some, some noise gates, some compression, some EQ put on, and this is kind of how I've been using it with the DLZ Creator XS, and same thing here. If I go over to the Rodecaster Duo, now you're listening to me in the Rode NT1 fifth generation on the Rode NT1 preset. So I kind of just wanted to point out that you have been listening to unprocessed audio this whole time. And now we're listening to audio that has some EQ and some compression and some noise gates applied to it. So this is the Rodecaster with a process signal. This is a Rodecaster with an unprocessed signal. This is the DLZ creator with a process signal. And this is the DLZ creator with an unprocessed signal. So. Just wanted to kind of point that out as we dive into the strengths and weaknesses of the Creator XS compared to the Rodecaster Duo. So the biggest strength of the DLZ Creator is the interface and the display. And especially if it's facing towards me like normal and not facing away from me. The way I can see everything, it's all big and bright and everything is full touch control is really awesome and makes things very easy to use. And while it's very different than a Rodecaster in a lot of ways, it doesn't take very long for you to kind of figure out how it works and how things change contextually based on what menu or interface you might be in. So just using the DLZ creator, the interface and the display is incredible. And the fact that this is still kind of, I think there've been a couple firmware updates for the DLZ creator. It is phenomenal. Back over here on the Rodecaster Duo, Rode's interface and displays are also really excellent and very user-friendly, but you can't quite dive into the depth that you can on the DLZ Creator XS, for better or worse. If you're a total beginner, maybe you don't want to do that. Back over on the DLZ Creator, another big strength is this right here, which is an Ethernet port in the back. And I know you might be saying, but Tom, is that really, is that port really that important? Because there is an Ethernet port on the back of the Rodecaster Duo. And with the DLZ Creator, Mackie, was really the first of these companies that makes these interface mixers 
that included Ethernet ports that actually did something interesting with them. Rode was the first one to put the Ethernet port in the Rodecaster Pro 2, and they kind of teased like, oh, it's gonna be used for some really cool stuff, but it's basically just been for firmware updates, which is not really, not, like you can do it via Wi-Fi, you can do it via USB. There's really no need to connect an ethernet cable just to do a firmware update every couple of months. But what Mackie did on both of the DLZ creators is you can use the ethernet port for full NDI functionality, which basically means once this is connected to your network via ethernet, it can then become an audio in-out device for anything else on that network. So you can control and input stuff from different rooms, different systems. You can have a computer in one room on the other side of your house or your studio or wherever and send its audio to the DLZ creator. So you can bring in all of these different sources. And that to me is kind of an artifact and a demonstration of Mackie's intention of the DLZ creator line being geared a little more professionally because that's the kind of functionality you would expect in something that you were gonna put in a studio. If you're building an actual more professional style studio around it, all that network functionality, connectivity, NDI features is something that would be really helpful and something that you might expect. It's not something I even personally need or really use, at least currently, so it wouldn't be a deciding feature for me if I were choosing between these two devices, but it's just kind of an example of Mackie's approach versus Rode's approach and how they're different. Mackie does have three different control modes for the DLZ creators. You have an easy, enhanced, and pro. Easy is like basic controls. You can almost not do anything. You plug in a mic, it kind of adjusts everything for you. You press record, maybe adjust your levels a little bit and you're good to go. Enhanced gives you some more manual control and then pro lets you dive in and control everything, which also means potentially mess up everything with full freedom. And so what's kind of cool, if you are a beginner, what you can do is you can start on that easy mode, learn the basics, move to enhanced mode and move over to pro mode. So even though it is kind of complicated and I would say for a beginner less user friendly than a roadcaster is, they do at least give you some kind of structure, some kind of framework to work within to help you understand how it works over time. And I did just mention that it can set things for you automatically. The DLZ line has really cool auto gain and auto mix features, which are super powerful. So auto gain, for example, if I go into the channel that I'm recording on right now, there's a little thing down here that says set gain automatically. If, and if I tap that when I connect my microphone, what it will do is I just talk for a few seconds it hears how loud I'm talking, it hears the dynamics in my voice, and it sets the gain perfectly based on the, the microphone and the level of input from my voice or whatever the sound source is. And then on top of that, there's auto mix, which right now I'm by myself, so it's a little tough to demonstrate. So what that means is when I press auto mix, a little menu is gonna pop up here that says channel one priority, equal weight, or channel two priority, because we do have two XLR inputs. and that can mean that channel one is gonna get gain priority. So if someone's over here on channel two making noise, channel one's gonna be mixed in heavier or louder than channel two is. You can have them set equally or you can have channel two have the priority. And that's great if you're recording with other people and you know, depending on the situation, you want one channel to have more weight than the other or what's probably the most common is to have that equal weight. You're recording with someone else, but that other person is, you know, they're changing the volume of their voice. They're getting further and closer to the microphone and things are changing and you're trying to dial in the audio. You don't have to worry about that because it will just do it for you and keep everything kind of perfectly even right there. And then you don't have to try to save your audio and fix all that stuff in editing afterwards. Something I absolutely love about both DLZ creators are these dials right here, which look very similar to the Rodecaster's headphone volume adjusters, and they are. The first one is the headphone volume adjusters, but what happens with the DLZ is when you go into a menu, the function of these dials immediately changes, and there's a little thing right here on the side of the display that tells you what you're now controlling. So if you go into EQ and you want to adjust your signal, now these are physical controls to let you a dial in your EQ or change whatever settings there might be. And whatever page you go to, whatever effects you go to, whatever menus you go to, these are completely contextual dials and their functionality changes. And if you go back to your home screen, which there is just this home button, kind of like the Rodecaster has a little digital home button here. This has a physical home button that I can just go right there and then I go right back to my main display. And I really love that because as I was trying to learn the original DLZ creator, it felt overwhelming, but it, as soon as I started diving into menus and realized that these knobs did sort of exactly what I would expect them to do no matter what page I was in in the menu or what setting I was on, it made it much easier to learn and kind of much more fun to use. And should mention while I'm talking about physical buttons, not only is there a home button, but there is a physical record button 
on the Creator XS. The Rodecaster Duo, one of my complaints is that there is no physical record button. There's just a digital one on the display here. And currently, you can't assign one of the smart pads to be a record button either, which is just a little... I like the physical button. And also in terms of accessibility, for some people, especially if you're visually impaired, the screen might not be a great way to like see that you're recording. And if I go into the menus, now I actually don't know that this is still recording or not because I have no way of telling that it's recording until I go back to the home screen. So having a big flashing record button is definitely helpful. And there are some really great things on the back of the DLZ Creator, including a 3.5 millimeter input. And then you also have separate USB-A connector to connect a hard drive or something if you wanna record directly to that. And then you also have USB-C to connect to your computer and run the interface that way. But right here, you can probably see this power cable is a locking connector, which means I can pull this and I can't pull out or bend or damage the power cable at all. This is how the original Rodecaster Pro the one back here, that's how its power cable was. But the Rodecaster Duo and the Rodecaster Pro 2 have a USB-C connector, and this is not good. And the reason I say that is because it's, it's a point of weakness. It's easy to just pull this out and then you lose power altogether on your Rodecaster. But also, as you move things around, I have had my USB-C connector get kind of bent and pulled just because I, you know, I turned the Rodecaster and the cable had some tension on and it pulled. If this were a locking connector, those wouldn't be issues and that wouldn't be a problem. So the USB-C connector is definitely a point of weakness and not my favorite way of using power versus the locking barrel connector of the Creator XS, the DLZ Creator, and the original Rodecaster Pro. And it's the same thing that like the ATEM Minis also use. So if you use an ATEM, it's that same setup. There's a reason all those devices use it because it works and it provides so much security and peace of mind. Give Rode a piece of my mind about that, huh? Yeah, anyway. But in addition to all the strengths of the Creator XS, there are some things that I think make it a little bit weaker than the Duo. And while the design and form factor are amazing, I really can't say enough good things about them. It is quite a bit more plasticky feeling overall. If you just hold them and you don't know much about them, they feel fairly similar in quality, but the Rodecaster Duo does feel a little bit more premium and a little bit better made. The top panel on the Rodecasters is metal and then the body is a hard plastic casing, whereas on the Creator XS, everything is just kind of a hard plastic. So it doesn't feel like it's going to fall apart or be super fragile or anything, but it doesn't feel quite as robust and premium as the Rodecaster Duo does. As much as I said that this power connector is great and perfect, the power switch on the Creator XS is actually something that I don't particularly like because it's just an old school rocker switch, which is incredibly satisfying to flip and turn on and off and everything. Same with the big DLZ Creator. The problem with that as nice as it is in today's day and age to just have a physical switch that actually turns something on or off, is that it is a physical switch that can turn something on or off. And on more than one occasion with the original DLZ Creator, I accidentally turned it off in the middle of recording because if you sort of have the device here and you kind of go to move it, sometimes you just naturally grab it right where the power switch is and you can just turn it off in the middle of a recording. Or you can have cables that press up against it or if this is up against a wall and you kind of move it a little bit while recording. It's easier than you would expect to bump and then have the power switch turn off in the middle of recording. And there's no protection or redundancy or anything built in to prevent that from happening. On the Rodecasters, I have had so many people tell me they hate the Rodecaster power button because it's sort of this like squishy red thing here. It is unbelievably unsatisfying to click this button because it's just like this squishy blobby mess. But the reason for that is it's very difficult to press this accidentally and you need to press it twice to turn the Rodecaster off. Same is true for the Duo and the Rodecaster Pro 2. So that means even if you're using this and you accidentally bump it once, you'd have to push it really hard and bump it really hard to press the button at all. And then that still wouldn't shut things down or turn things off. It would give you the confirmation screen. Do you actually want to turn this off or not? You would have to do that twice to accidentally turn this off while recording. So essentially, that's just not something that can happen, whereas it's very easy to turn this off accidentally while recording. But it's very easy to accidentally pull out the power supply of the Rodecaster and have it turn off while you're recording, while it's impossible to pull out the power supply of the Creator XS and have it to accidentally turn off. So if you combined them, it would be the perfect system, a locking power connector with a power switch that has some kind of protection and redundancy built into it. But each one of these is in danger of accidentally being turned off. It's just sort of 
a different danger. I've been neglecting the roadcaster in this comparison. Let's switch over here. Another bummer with the Creator XS is that it does not have any kind of mount on the back. And same with the, the big DLC Creator, which since it's such a giant device, being able to mount it easily places would would really help. The Roadcaster Duo has a vase mount, so you can use this with any monitor arm. I made a whole video about how much I love having my Roadcaster off the desk and how nice it is to have it on an arm, and it can help with cable management and everything. This has nothing on the bottom. It just has rubber pads. There's no way to connect this. You might be able to get one of those laptop arms that kind of has a platform, and you can put the you can put this on that almost like people did with the original roadcaster which mike am i talking into it's this one over here but there's no other way to mount this so it really is kind of made to live on your desk fortunately it's sort of a beautiful interface and the angle of it it's it's like a very nice thing to use when it's on your desk but unless you find some creative solution it's going to have to live on your desk or your table surface and as i kind of alluded to earlier you do have six physical sound pads on both of these devices and you can do really cool things with them but setting up the smart pads especially if you are just using them for sound effects is so much easier on the Roadcaster because you can just use Road Central. It's kind of a drag and drop thing. They're not dependent on your memory card. So if you take the memory card out, you don't lose your sound effects or anything like that. The Mackie is a little trickier when it comes to loading in sound effects and things, which is just when there's more friction in that process and in that workflow, it's one of those things that you're less likely to do. So the Roadcaster, I usually don't think twice about adding in new sound effects, changing what the smart pads do, all that kind of stuff. This since it is a little bit more of a pain i don't like to do it as often so i don't change it i'm not quite as dynamic with how i use the little sound pads and the control buttons right here i also gotta say especially as i'm looking at these right here i love how bright and saturated the roadcasters controls and dials are i i love the i love when these are in the background of my videos because they, like, they look beautiful and they're kind of out of focus bouquet i love this big bright saturated colorful thing this is pretty and colorful but it's a little like it's just a little more desaturated. It's not quite as in your face. Some people might love that. I like the big, bright, colorful thing of the Roadcaster. The main point I meant to make right there was not about the buttons, but it was about the ease of loading that and also Road Central because Road Central is incredibly well done software that pairs very nicely with the Roadcaster. Not that you have to use either of these with a computer ever, but it's really nice. Road Central is great and being able to use this with that is great. Something that both of these annoy me with is that they record to micro SD cards. There is more than enough room for a full size SD card port on these, but they record to micro SD, which is just annoying. Full size SD would just be easier. You know, computers, it's more common for them to have a full size SD card reader than a micro SD card reader. And sometimes that's my favorite way of transferring files easily is just to take the memory card out and pop it in the computer. It's nice not to have to use an adapter or a dongle or anything like that. So let's go back over to the Creator XS. So it is kind of tough, if not near impossible, to cover every feature of both of these devices, but these really are the biggest differences that stick out to me the most. Now, that aside, obviously sound quality is kind of important, right, when it comes to devices like these. So it sounds like a good idea to dive into that a bit more now. Both the XS and the Duo have really powerful preamps that are capable of powering just about any mic that you throw at them, whether it's condenser or dynamic, or heck, even like a ribbon microphone. The Creator XS has 80 decibels of gain, whereas the Rodecaster Duo has 76 decibels of gain. So more clean gain in the DLZ Creator, but if, if you're at a point where 80 is gonna make a difference versus 76, I don't know what kind of microphone, that's, they're essentially equal for all intents and purposes. But I have been recording on a condenser microphone because this is just the microphone I have two similar ones of, so trying to get you the same sound quality here without me having to switch constantly. Let's switch though to the good old Shure SM7B, a well-known quiet microphone that needs a lot of gain in order to sound good and see how this sounds between these two interfaces. So as I'm connecting this to the DLZ Creator, I'll be able to show you that auto gain setting in action. So what I'm gonna do right now is press set gain automatically, talk into the SM7B, and then you should hear it set that gain level. Let's see. Into the SM7B, all right, look at that. There, it set my gain level automatically. I just had to talk at the volume that I was going to talk into, and now we're all set. And that is the amount of gain, which is actually, where am I at? I'm using 48 decibels of gain. If I crank this all the way up, 
there. Now I'm at 80. You can use my SM7B as a boom mic, which is not something I would actually want to do. Uh, this does not sound great. I'm gonna turn that back down. And you can kind of hear, this is a pretty quiet preamp. I don't have any of the EQ or processing turned on, so there's no noise gate or anything. And if I stop talking, you can hear a little bit of that noise floor if I turn it up the gain. But right here at 58 or actually 48 decibels where the excess set the gain to be, this is what that sounds like. And it sounds pretty decent. And I can also then even boost it a little bit with the dial down here if I wanted to go beyond Unity. So point being, you don't need boosters or cloud lifters or anything with either of these devices. They both have really good preamps. But now if I turn on some of the basic processing, you can hear that noise floor is gone because now there's a noise gate. So even if I turn this all the way up, it still, say, it still stays pretty quiet. And the noise gate I have found is very usable on the DLZ Creator, just like the Rodecaster. It doesn't sound super harsh or super artificial or anything like that. And I can even go into a preset the same way that I can in the Rodecaster. There is an SM7B preset that I can load up. And now this is the DLZ's SM7B preset. If I turn it off, this is now the dry signal of the SM7B with no effects and no processing. And now this is the processed signal with some effects and some processing. I'm not crazy about this preset personally, but fortunately, when you dial in your settings, you can create a new preset very easily the same way you can on the Rodecaster Pro 2. This is now me with no effects and no processing using the SM7B on the Rodecaster Duo at 50 decibels of gain. And if I bring up the gain all the way to its available 76, that's what the noise floor sounds like. So we'll do the Roadcaster's max gain and the XS's max gain. So here's the Roadcaster. So you wouldn't want to max out the gain on either one, um, especially if you're just not using any effects or processing. But if I turn on the SM7B preset, then we've got this kind of sound here, which I think sounds pretty excellent. And I use this a lot. I do really like the presets in the Rodecasters. I think Rode did an excellent job, even on a mic like this, a Shure microphone. That's not a Rode mic, but there's still a preset for the SM7B and it still sounds excellent. So this does add in some of that noise gate and some of that EQ and compression and just sort of really makes the mic shine a little bit. But as you can see, using the SM7B, it's totally possible to use a very quiet dynamic microphone without a booster with either of these devices and get a great sound. But speaking of great sound, you also wanna make sure that the sound you're listening to when you're monitoring is pretty great. Now the original Rodecaster Pro had some pretty rough headphone amps in it that were pretty noisy and you heard a lot of static and you couldn't tell if that was in the recording or not. It usually wasn't, but it kind of drove me crazy. The Rodecaster Pro 2 and the Rodecaster Duo have much better headphone amps and the Creator XS have, has much better headphone amps as well. So back over here on the Creator XS, listening to my headphones, there is a lot of, there's a lot of gain in the headphone amps here. I can definitely turn them up louder than I would want on both of these devices. Overall, going between them, I do think the Creator XS has better headphone amps. They sound a bit cleaner and it seems like they can go a bit louder. And I just enjoy listening to this device through headphones a little more than the Rodecasters. Something that's happened with the Rodecasters, and I don't know if it's just mine or what, the headphone amps are very clean, but every once in a while I hear a little it's just a little like, it almost sounds like a, a fuzz or a pop in the signal and it's totally random and it's taken me a long time to become confident and knowing that that's not being recorded <laughs> to whatever I'm actually recording and it's just a thing that sort of happens in the headphone amp from time to time. I don't know if it's interference or what. Uh, it's definitely annoying and it's definitely distracting. That has not happened at all with the Creator XS. The headphone amp is awesome and it sounds great and what I'm hearing is exactly what the end result is what's being sent out via an interface or recorded to SD card or whatever it might be. But with all of that in mind, I do want to dive deeper into that relationship between Mackie and Rode that I talked about earlier because it is eroding some of my confidence and some it's it's making me nervous. Now, this is all very much my own opinion, but I do think it's worth talking about. Earlier, I said that the DLZ creator, the original one, was exciting to me because it was the first, I felt, true competitor to the Rodecaster Pro. And I thought this would be a great thing because it would push Rode to tighten up some of the Rodecaster's quirks, like those headphone amps that I just talked about, and continue to keep it competitive, while at the same time, Mackie would want to continue to prove 
that the DLZ line is a more premium device with more professional capabilities. And I thought that was gonna be a good thing because both companies would kind of leapfrog each other as they attempted to make better and better products and release better and better firmware updates. But then Rode bought Mackie. And when that was first announced, I saw a lot of people online celebrating. It was almost like your two favorite bands had announced a tour together. And it was like, wow, I love both of these bands. And now they're going on tour together. But I think it's really more like one of your favorite bands sort of absorbed all of the members of your other favorite band. And now it's kind of unclear if that other band is going to get to play any more shows, write any more albums. Are those members going to be performing separately? Are they going to be kind of absorbed into the other band and perform all together? Are some people not going to be in the band, any band anymore? And you don't really know. And so I kind of was a lot less excited about the announcement of Road buying Mac because now I don't know really what is going on and I'm actually kind of nervous about the future for Mackie which is slightly damping my excitement for the XS. How much motivation, I'm wondering, will Rode have to continue improving the DLZ lineup if it risks competing with the Rodecaster lineup? Based on the timing of the XS's release, it takes so much time to develop, create, manufacture a product. And the announcement of Rode buying Mackie I personally think that the XS is sort of a remaining artifact from a time before anyone knew that Rode was gonna buy Mackie. This is, a, this is an example of how Mackie was wanting to compete with what Rode was offering, and it is a very good competition. And I think that's a very good thing for us as customers. But now, I really don't know what that future holds because the XS and the original DLZ creator are really great devices. And they're always going to be at least as good and at least as capable as they are right now. But even more so than usual, I really wouldn't recommend counting on future updates either in terms of firmware or new products. In fact, I kind of hate to say this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Rode took some of the DLZ's strongest features like auto mix or maybe some of the interface stuff or even the better headphone amps or who knows what some of those stronger features and just incorporated that into future roadcasters while just ending the DLZ product line altogether. Of course, that's just me speculating. I have no idea what will happen. I have no information about what is or is not happening. But what I do know is that less competition and fewer choices usually don't end up being in the customer's best interest. And in the case of the DLZ creator XS, that makes me extra sad. But you know what makes me extra glad? Let's dig out of this sad hole here. Everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships, thank you very much for all of your continued support. And if you do want to know more about the Roadcaster Duo, check out my full review right here or this other super awesome video that the algorithm has selected specifically for you.